All right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. I'm Faisal Istarabadi. I am the founding director of the Center for the Study of the Middle East, and I'm just delighted to be able to uh, welcome uh, um, a very dear friend, Ambassador Barbara Bodine, whom I've known, uh, it's getting close to be 20 years now, although I was trying to remember how we met and I can't quite remember precisely how we met, but I know it had something to do with Iraq and your being in Iraq in 2003, uh, which is also when I returned to Iraq. So it's been a long time, but uh, I'm delighted to be able to host you virtually um, and look forward uh, to being able to host uh, Ambassador Bodine uh, in person when uh, uh, when we're allowed uh, and uh, to do so. Uh, uh, hopefully, in the days post pandemic, may we live to see them. Um, before I move on to introducing Ambassador Bodine, uh, let me uh, just sort of set out how we do this. And uh, what we'll do is that uh, Sesame's. Uh, uh, Associate uh, Director Dr. Carl Pearson will moderate a discussion afterwards. I may take uh, convener's uh, uh, prerogative and ask a question or two ahead of time. But after that, uh, questions will be uh, mediated through Dr. Pearson uh, through the chat box. So if you, um, uh, if you can um, uh, find the chat box at the sort of bottom of the uh, screen, click on that and send your uh, questions either directly to Carl Pearson or to everybody if you prefer. Dr. Pearson will moderate the questions to Ambassador Bodine uh, and we'll remind you of that at the end. Um, let me uh, 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 introduce Ambassador Bodine, although I will uh, uh, edit down or expurgate her um, biography because it is a rich and varied biography, one of service uh, to the country and uh, one of uh, service uh, to humanity through uh, NGOs. Um, but it would take, uh, I'd rather hear from her this afternoon than, uh, than talk about her. Uh, but let me hit a few of the highlights. Ambassador Barbara K. Bodine is distinguished professor in the practice of diplomacy and concurrent director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University. Prior to joining, joining Georgetown uh, University's School of Foreign Service, she taught and directed uh, policy task forces and policy workshops on US diplomacy in the Persian Gulf re uh, region, uh, including Iraq and Yemen for seven years at Princeton University School of Public and International Affairs and served as director of the school's uh, scholars in the nation's service initiative, a fellowship program for students pursuing careers in uh, federal service. Ambassador Bodine uh, has over 30 years of uh, uh, service in the US uh, uh, or had before her uh, retirement over 30 years uh, service in the US foreign service where she, which she spent primarily on uh, Arabian Peninsula and greater Persian, Persian Gulf uh, issues, uh, specifically US bilateral and regional policy, strategic security issues, counterterrorism, and governance and reform. Her tour as ambassador to the Republic of Yemen in 1997 to 2001 uh, saw enhanced support for democratization and increased security and counterterrorism cooperation uh, Ms. Bodine also served in Baghdad as deputy principal officer during uh, the Iran-Iraq war. Um, she served also in Kuwait as deputy uh, chief of mission during the Iraqi invasion and occupation of Iraq in 1990 and 1991. <clears throat> Excuse me, and again, seconded to the Department of Defense in Iraq in 2003. So she's had a number of postings uh, in Iraq, which matter a great deal to me, always it seems at critical moments uh, in Iraq's history. And I say that I'm unfortunate, but critical moments. Um, 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 and she was the first senior uh, department of, uh, State Department official and the first coalition coordinator for reconstruction in Baghdad and the central uh, governorates. Her first assignments in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs uh, uh, was as country officer for 
uh, the two Yemens and security assistance coordinator for the peninsula. She later returned to the office as deputy director. Since leaving government, Ambassador Bodin has been founding director of the Governance Initiative in the Middle East and senior fellow at the Kennedy uh, School of uh, Government at Harvard and the Robert uh, Wilhelm Fellow uh, at MIT Center for International Studies. She's a past president of the Mine Awareness Group America, a global NGO that provides technical expertise in the removal of remnants of conflict uh, worldwide. Uh, she's a native of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, she was a Phi Beta Kappa and Magnum, uh, Magna Cum Laude uh, graduate of the University of California, Santa Barbara in political science and East Asian studies and earned her master's at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. She's a recipient of the Distinguished Alumni Award from uh, both UC Santa Barbara and the Fletcher School, and she is a Regent Emerita of the University of California. Uh, please join me in welcoming yeah. Ambassador Barbara Bodin uh, for her talk entitled this afternoon, Yemen, the Middle East in Microcosm. Thank you. And as you've been, first of all, that was a, a very gracious introduction. Um, and and it always surprises me when I when I either hear it or have to read my own bio. Um, I actually came into the Foreign Service with a degree in Chinese studies, <laughs> which is <laughs> and five years of studying Chinese. Um, and uh, if if any if all of you did not hear anything about that go by in the bio, you're right. Um, and I was also trying to remember when we first met, and I think that you are such a deep and valued friend that I have lost that moment. You have always been there as one of my friends. So it doesn't have a start date, and hopefully does not have an end date. Um, and interestingly, I, when I uh, was in the department, I actually did have some tours in Asia, um, I decided as, as only a very pretentious 25 year old can, that I was far too focused on China and I needed to do something different to see some more of the world. And through a story I won't go into, I pitched up as the Yemen desk officer and security assistance for the peninsula. I did not know anything about the Middle East, zero. And I thought, well, I'll do this for two years get a little bit of perspective, and then I'll go back to Asia, which is where I spent my whole career, my, my career, uh, my formative years. And uh, as clear from the bio, I never got back to Asia. I, I, I got the sand in my shoes and uh, that was it. And uh, ended up staying for basically my career without any regrets. Yeah, there were some days where I kind of wished I was someplace else, I will admit. Um, but there was never a time that I wished to be doing something else. So thank you again for this invitation. Um, in a few short months, we are going to mark the 10th anniversary of uh, what was called the Arab Spring, a gnome to academia that the scholar who came up with it deeply regrets, if nothing else, because it didn't happen in the spring. Uh, this was a series of uprisings, uh, small point, yeah, uh, across the Arab world um, that began in Tunisia, spread to Egypt, uh, Syria, Libya, uh, and to Yemen, and briefly in Bahrain. It was not a coordinated movement. It didn't have a coherent ideology. It didn't have recognized leaders um, or even an agreed agenda. But it did have um, some shared common roots. It was the economy, it was demography, it was technology, and as a result of those three, it was governance. And all of these intrinsically work, uh, woven together. They were not a democratic uprising per se. Um, or at least the way that we in the West and, and, and the US wanted to see them. And with the possible exception of Tunisia, they have not left the people in the Middle East better off economically, politically, or socially. They have, however, reshaped the geopolitical landscape within the region. They've realigned the balance of power. They've shifted the locus of influence. 
and they've created a Cold War-like bipolar competition using proxy forces for control of power, politics, and resources. At its most basic, the Arab Spring was an eruption of economic grievances led by marginal youth mobilized through technology who blamed, largely correctly, their plight on chronic maladministration of the state and kleptocratic leadership, economy, demography, technology, and governance. Poverty per se is not at the region's core economic challenges, although poverty is far more widespread than many Americans understand. The core challenge is that the wealth is unevenly distributed both within individual states and within the region, exacerbated by rampant corruption and cronyism. Narrowly based economies, largely rentier states who are dependent on either a single commodity, oil, or tourism, or assistance. They lack, there's a lack of intra-regional trade, a lack of foreign and domestic investment beyond just these dominant sectors, and education systems that neither match the current economic structures nor position the states, the economies, and most importantly, the youth to move forward in any kind of an effective or efficient way. In the 1990s, for example, the Arab economies grew by less than 1% on a per capita basis. And FDI to GDP was less than half the global average. The nation's exports were half of that of the Philippines, the entire region. And corruption is estimated to have drained about one trillion, with a T, dollars from the, from the region. Despite the massive oil wealth in some of the small Gulf states and not all of them, the region's economies, economic and employment opportunities were at best stagnant and in many cases declining. We all tend to fixate on the glitz and the glamor of Abu Dhabi, the opulence of Saudi palaces, and we support tourism based on the pyramids, Palmyra, Petra, and Carthage, all relics of distant glorious past. Beirut coasted for decades on a tattered image of the Paris of the Middle East until it literally blew up in its face. This was unsustainable. The global recession of the mid 2000s combined with a spike in world food prices precipitated by climate change knocked the struts out from many of these economies. Our foreign policy for decades was predicated on energy security, oil security. In the Middle East, it, it was and is predicated on food security. Changes in food prices can be as cataclysmic to the macroeconomics and the quality of life in this region as oil spikes can be in this country. Left in the ruins of all of this was a burgeoning population of young people without relevant educations or even sometimes any meaningful education and without prospects for employment and thus a meaningful life. In the Arab world, you do not fully transition to adulthood without marriage and you cannot get married without employment and thus you're stuck in limbo. And one very good book on this is called Generation in Waiting. There's much to recommend youth, many of you who are with us today but patience and forbearance are not traits normally associated with youth at any time and any place. About two thirds of the population of the Middle East is under the age of 30, which translates to massive pressure on infrastructure, education, health, and labor, and therefore on social stability. Besides the sheer dominance of these numbers, the young were also connected to the outside world in ways their parents were not, and in ways their grandparents could not even have imagined. They knew or imagined they knew what they were missing. They could see it, they could hear it, they knew it. It's not a major leap from this confluence of economic stagnation, demographic shifts, and technological connections to understand that the status quo was just not tolerable. 
especially given the scholaric governments headed by elites in power, often for longer than most of their population had been alive. These are leaders disconnected in time and experience from their people and in many cases, seemingly unaware or, or indifferent. So the Arab Spring was not a, it was not a surprise the Arab Spring happened, only the exact moment that it happened. So let's take this down another notch to Yemen, a country that typifies so much of what drove the spring and so much of what has gone wrong, maybe how to make it right again. Nowhere were the roots of the convulsions more manifest, the promises greater, and the results of failure more tragic than in Yemen. Yemen almost made it and then it didn't. The protests in Yemen were in fact planned and openly discussed prior to the fall of Tunisia's Ben Ali. I happened to be in Yemen that week and met with people very openly talking about how they were about to have um, major demonstrations and bring down the government. These protests were gonna happen with or without Tunisia or Egypt. Change Square and its counterparts across the country um, never faced the unremitting violence that we've seen in Syria and Libya. NATO was not needed to stop a genocide. A national dialogue conference of nearly 600 Yemenis debated for months in ways that we Americans can only envy and respect, debated a new social contract a new constitution, new elections, and a new beginning. And then it didn't happen. Yemen looked to be one of only two states in the Middle East to come out of the Arab Spring as success. And then it didn't. The dynamics within and beyond Yemen made it impossible to succeed. But Yemen had pulled back from the brink of failure and war so many times in its modern history right through the National Dialogue Conference that this always almost failing state looked like it might muddle through once again, not sufficiently, not pretty, not a success, but avoiding a failure. And then they didn't. Yemen is an odd choice for a case study on much of what happens in the Middle East. Um, I am going to, I'm, not even gonna to try to do my PowerPoint. <laughs> I'll just mess it up. So stay with me. It's geographically isolated from the region. It's bordered on the Northwest by very rugged mountains, on the East by the unremitting empty quarter. And then along the Red Sea and the Gulf of Oman by about 2000 kilometers of coast. It doesn't share the oil and gas wealth of its peninsula neighbors. There's a charming Yemeni folk story that when God made the peninsula, he tipped it one way and all the oil ended up on the Gulf side. And then he tipped it the other way and all the people ended up in Yemen. Except for the British crown colony in Aden, uh, Yemen escaped colonialism. Even the British protectorates east of Aden were left to govern themselves the way they always had without colonial meddling. North Yemen, which was actually west of South Yemen. So this part of understanding Yemen is that nothing makes sense. So North Yemen uh, was ruled for a thousand years by a Zaidi Imam who very comfortably kept it somewhere around the 1700s. The Turks came in for a while, kind of took a look at trying to govern Yemen and left. Um, it's an ancient, ancient country. It's the source of apocryphal and some very legitimate origin stories, particularly the diaspora of what we now call Emiratis and Omanis following the collapse of the ancient Marib Dam. And they have trade connections as far as East, East Asia and all the way down East Africa. The Yemenis were foot soldiers for the Arab conquest along North Africa into Spain. Zabid was an Islamic center of learning and brought us algebra, for which I forgive them. Columbus's navigator was a Yemeni. 
it's the land of the Queen of Sheba, although the Ethiopians contest that. It's perhaps the home of the three wise men, frankincense and myrrh do come from there. And they claim to be the burial place of Cain and Abel. They brought us coffee um, and the stained glass windows. All of this, so the Yemenis believe. And that's always the most important fact in any narrative. With that narrative, the Yemenis see themselves as descendants of a deep and important history unmatched by its immediate neighbors. Garibaldi famously said, now that we have created Italy, we need to create Italians. Yemen's the reverse of that. There is a very strong sense of a Yemeni identity, of Yemeniness, but there's really no clear sense of a Yemeni state. Yemen's modern history has not been as kind to it as its ancient history or its stark and beautiful land. The size of Texas or France, its population is close to 30 million. So when God tipped all the people, the population of Yemen equals that of the rest of the peninsula. And it's vastly younger than even the skewed demographics of the rest of the region. While 60% of the population is under 25, 40% of the population is under 14. Nearly half the population are still teenagers. The median age is less than 20 years old. Despite its landmass, less than 3% of it is arable, virtually all of it in the Northwest, heavily terraced, or a very narrow strip of coast. And most critically, size of Texas, there are no rivers, no lakes, no surface fresh water in the entire country. And water is life. Abdulaziz Al Saud was reportedly very disappointed when the American engineers discovered marketable quantities of oil in the Eastern province and said dismissively, my people can't drink oil. Well, the Yemenis have neither water nor oil. They have not enough oil to even satisfy domestic. And they lack any minerals. It's a beautiful country, and that's about it. It has long been food insecure, well before the world, before the war. It was one of the 10th largest grain importers in the world, and it has always been assistance dependent. It's only viable export for decades was migrant workers. Upwards of a majority of the working men worked abroad in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And that tradition actually goes back further. With the end of migrant labor in the Gulf states and the population boom that followed their return, I actually had a student ask me why those two were connected. I didn't think I had to explain that. Um, and before the current war, Unemployment among young men was at least 25% and probably considerably higher. So not surprisingly, Yemen is, was, and may remain one of the most persistently poor countries in the world and is comfortably at the bottom of most development industries. Yet, despite all of this, through the 90s and through the 2000s up until about 2011, Yemen was the only viable semi-democracy in the region, the peninsula states and the Horn of Africa. With its negotiated unification in 1990, same time the Germans reunited, which was a fatally flawed stapling together of this medieval imamate in the north, this British crown colony directly below it, and these feudal sultanates off to the east, Yemen ushered in a very fragile, a very wobbly, but I think a very sincere effort at decent governance. There was a constitution, which constitutional scholars have looked at and said it was good. It granted full rights to women, which we still don't have in ours. Multiple 
legal political parties contested for seats in a parliament, including some Southern communists who rebranded themselves as socialists, a legal Islamist party that was a weird combination of Northern Zaidi tribesmen and urban Muslim brotherhood, and then the major party, which was this centrist kind of Arab national socialist thing. Basic rights, um, certainly of assembly, certainly of speech. Uh, the Yemenis, if there's 30 million Yemenis, there's at least 30 million views on any given issue, very publicly shared. Press, probably more irresponsible than, than it should have been, but it was certainly free. And a level of religious tolerance. And they held, held multiple elections, which were deemed by the international community as free and fair. It was not strong. Nobody had any real I, you know, delusions about it, but it was crabbing its way towards this. It was idiosyncratic. It reflected the culture and the traditions, but it worked. It was muddling through as it always did until the day that it didn't. Why Yemen failed? why it fell into civil, to a civil war that it had avoided for so long, and why it became the greatest and the most grotesque human, humanitarian crisis in the world, speak to the forces that brought the entire region to chaos. The economy was unsustainable and collapsing, and the income disparities were becoming more pronounced. The government lacked funds to provide basic services, especially to this young population for education and health. And employment for, there was no employment for those transitioning into a non-existent job market. While fertility rates had dropped dramatically from seven children per woman when I was ambassador to less to about four, only a generation later, contraception, was available to 40% of the women and the demand was actually greater. The bulge under 25 and particularly this bulge under 15, this means that there is going to be a second surge of population. Technology is very, there is a very dense cell phone penetration in Yemen. Don't try to use a landline. Um, and they are aware of what's going on in the world. They're on social media, they're on Twitter, they're on YouTube. Um, they know what else is going on in the world. And then finally, not only was the government unable, didn't have the money to provide basic services or a modicum of hope of opportunity, it had really ceased to function. President Abdallah, Ali Abdullah Saleh had been in power since 1979. Um, I had been desk officer for Yemen before, just months before he came in, which was often an, a useful talking point. But he had been in power since 1979. And most of the governing elite were those who had either fought in the Republican Revolution to get rid of the Imam in the 60s or in the War of National Liberation in the South to get rid of the Brits. They were still the power structure. Those of us who worked on Yemen for decades, who had the opportunity to live there for almost four years, we were always buoyed by the resilience of the Yemeni people. And the fact that despite all of this data, everything that said that your country is a failure, they never gave up. They always were there trying to make it somehow better. They believed in their own country and themselves in a way that those of us in the international community felt very deeply that if they haven't given up on Yemen, we shouldn't either. And then they didn't. With the political winds from Tunisia and Egypt at their back, the Tunisians finally called for, to called out the government and called for Saleh to step down. It was a negotiated transfer of power and those in change square declared victory, packed up their tents and went home. Part of it was this national dialogue conference, which diligently worked to try to craft a new Yemen. It didn't, what went so wrong? There was this call for change. There was this 
transition to change, and this work towards change. The Yemenis don't have baked into their society a lot of those factors that have bedeviled other states that have failed in the region. There is a Zaidi Shafi split, but they're not actually Sunni Shia. Um, and it was never really an issue in Yemeni society if you were Zaidi or Shafi. Most people didn't even know what the other person was. It never rose to the level of Lebanon or Iraq. There were regional rivalries between the north and the south and the east, but they weren't comparable to Libya's. They were much more ethnically homogeneous. There are no major minority groups in Yemen. And while it was conservative and clan-based, it's not comparable to Somalia. So it has all these centripetal forces that should have and had overcome the centrifugal forces, but they couldn't overcome the economy, the governance, the need of the population. And so what you had with the Arab Spring in Yemen was a transition from, but not a transition to. There was no agreement what now. The Houthi came into Sana'a in September 14 with a kind of a coup and there was going to be a civil war. I think everybody who knows Yemen knew that there would be a civil war. That would have been tragedy enough. That would have been a major tragedy. But here is the last part of the case study with the region. And that was the internationalization or at least the regionalization of a civil war that was really rooted in local grievances. The decision of the Saudis and the Emiratis to intervene the end of March 2015, four years after the Arab Spring and Change Square, and now almost six years ago, reflects the new geopolitical realities and rivalries in the region and the way they have been and will continue to play out in the fractured states of the region. It is too simple and it is wrong to describe the intervention as a continuation of the Sunni-Shia divide, in part because the Yemenis are neither Sunni nor Shia. This war is not about theology. It's about politics and power. It is too simple to say that it is to counter Iranian expansion and influence however well that plays with Americans. The Houthi insurgency, although neo Zaidi, existed long before and independent of the Iranians. For those who know the details of Islam, uh, the Zaidis are fivers and the Iranians are twelvers. The Houthi fought the Saleh regime for nearly 10 years with no assistance or backing from Iran whatsoever. Um, and the Houthis joined both Change Square peacefully and the National Dialogue. So the Iranians never, neither created the Houthi and they do not control the Houthi. Even at looking at this at a lens, through the lens of Saudi counter-revolutionary politics and Emirati anti-Islamist dynamics, it begs the question why the Saudis waited four years from Change Square to intervene. And it also, begs the Emirati's very awkward alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood Party in Yemen, which may be what drove them out. This compound complexity of intervention goes back as much to Saudi Emirati control of politics in the region and the rise in the ambition of the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Legacy powers, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, have long since collapsed as the arbiters of power and politics in the region. Riyadh and Abu Dhabi have stepped in and are stepping in to fill that vacuum and they're trying to reshape the region to fit their priorities. While the circular firing squad in Yemen has played out with an asymmetry of weaponry, Yemen, which was barely holding on in 2014 has just collapsed. What very little oil they had has see, is dropped to a trickle. The central bank is fractured and no longer functioning. 
and the infrastructure such as it was, education, health, roads, water, have all been destroyed. As a result, Yemen has the worst famine or near famine in the world, the worst cholera diarrheal outbreak in the world, destruction of its historical cultural heritage and infrastructure, and of course now COVID. A recent study by UNDP calculated that Yemeni development in the five years at that time of the war, Yemeni development had been set back 20 years by this war. And 20 years ago, it was not good. Every year of fighting adds to upwards of five years of regression. The battle lines have been stagnant for years, although the Houthis are making some gains. Whatever the Saudi agenda was, it has failed. The kaleidoscopic political and military alliances are on hyperdrive right now, and the country risks fracturing. There's one other catastrophe that faces Yemen and the region that is going to corrode whatever progress is achievable short term politically and economically in probably much of the region, and that's climate change. This is an existential threat to Yemen, to the region, to their future. Changing weather patterns means droughts in the highland terraces, which are dependent on monsoons, and flooding along the coast and in the major cities in Aden and Sana'a. Deadly flooding. The rising sea levels sour the coastal agricultural plains and could swamp the three ports that Yemen depends on to survive. The shift in patterns also changes the pattern of vector-borne diseases, malaria, dengue fever, and is seen in the horn, locusts. I think we have all of the plagues except for the frogs at this point. Yemen is one of the least contributors to global warming, but it is one of the most vulnerable and least prepared. And this is not just a problem for Yemen. Droughts prompted the Syrian civil war as much as Assad's government. The sea level rises threaten every coastal global city in the Gulf and their gas and oil resources and their water. And the disruption of food production around the world disrupts food security throughout the region. What it will take to reverse this confluence of trends and pressures on the region as a whole on specific areas of conflict, the political and social stability of states and on Yemen takes us back to first principles. The economy, employment and education must be addressed. These, these are political, but they are economic. They are economic at their roots. Population stabilization, investment and development, a couple of years ago, the, the damage to Yemen had already been calculated at $14 billion to simply bring it back to where it was in 2014, which was inadequate. Obviously, decent governance. And I'm not going to call for Jeffersonian or Hamiltonian or Madison-like democracy, but decent governance, which addresses the people's needs and listens to the people. And there's going to have to be global action on climate change. And since we now may have, we think we have a new government in transition here, um, it's going to take the international community to understand that what happens here affects everyone, that there are no parts of the world that are irrelevant, there are no people who are insignificant. And there are no problems that will go away on their own. We've, as a recognition that, as we saw in the Yemenis and I've seen elsewhere, the people in the region have not given up. We can't write them off. We can't give up and we can't walk away. And in the meantime, unfortunately, the Yemen of Rome's Arabia Felix, which was happy Arabia or fertile Arabia, for now is a hope, but it's one that I will hold on to. 
So thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara, for that uh, fascinating uh, talk. Uh, it really was superb and a tour de force. Um, I have a couple of questions, uh, if I may, and this sort of inhered in something you said. Uh, I've actually sort of written about Saudi policy in, in, in Yemen, incidental to writing about ISIL in Iraq and Syria because it seemed to me that at, at a critical moment, Saudi Arabia made the choice in 2014-15, rather than engaging in the international fight against ISIL, it chose to, and the Emirates along with it, chose to deploy their resources in, um, in, uh, yeah. in Yemen. And yeah. for some of us, and I, I think you'll agree with the premise, but if not, please tell me, I think for some of us, uh, actually the, campaign against the Houthis after they came to power in late 2014 actually drove the Houthis into Iran's arms mm -hmm. uh, and has made sort of disentangling. I mean, that's one more complex layer uh, to disentangle the problems of Yemen. And I think that inheres in what you said that the Houthis had for years fought the Saleh regime or government without, without support from uh, Iran and has sort of made them much more dependent on Iran than they were prior to, to this uh, intervention. I wonder if you can give us your opinion about that, whether I have that wrong or how you see that possibly being disentangled potentially by a Biden administration. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, first of all, I, I, I completely agree that, um, you know, rather than engaging with, with ISIL, the Saudis and the Emiratis, slightly different reasons, um, came into Yemen in March. Um, and I think there were a number of, of factors. Uh, one was, I do remember the January, January 15, I was having lunch with some fellow Yemeni watchers. And phones all started to buzz at us. And we had gotten word the King Abdullah had died. And we all looked at each other and said, this is not good for Yemen. We don't know why or how, we don't know how, but this will not be good for Yemen. Um, King Salman coming in, and most importantly, King Salman bringing in his son, Mohammed bin Salman, <coughs> changed the calculations. Um, MBS is deeply ambitious, not well experienced, and needed to prove himself. And um, as too many states have done, including us, they looked at the quality of their military, hard, their military hardware, not their military, looked at scrummy, poor Yemen and thought, we can take care of this in a matter of weeks. <coughs> the number of wars that have started off with, well, I'll be home by Christmas or whatever. So there was a, Somebody said this about the Americans going into Iraq, but there was arrogance, ordinance, and ignorance. And it was a deadly combination, mostly for people on the other side. They underestimated the Yemenis. They underestimated the topography. Um, and they thought it was going to be easy. They did wrap it in this specter of Iranian influence uh, they put it into a Sunni-Shia divide. And those of us who work on Yemen, you know, when we were on various news programs, always had to start with Yemen's not Sunni-Shia. <laughs> you, you've got, you've got a, a trope that doesn't fit. Um, the Iranians, however, played this magnificently. Whether you like them or not or agree with them or not, these are the people who invented chess and they played chess while the Saudis were playing checkers. Um, the Iranians figured out that by doing almost nothing, but kind of popping up behind a wall and going blah, 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 um, this, <laughs> there's a diplomatic term for that, but it escapes me. Um, the Saudis are so obsessed with Iran, so obsessed with Shia, their own, and the Iranian influence on them, that they 
were drawn in by the Iranians. Now, what was Iran's major focus? Iran's major interests are Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. What did they want? Least of all, was the Saudis and Emiratis becoming involved in the fights there. They want that band of states, as you know quite well. By taunting the Saudis, they were able to drag the Saudis southward. The Saudi policy apparatus, such as it is, completely distracted. The military completely distracted. Enormous sums of money being expended. So Saudi treasure, Saudi time, Saudi talent were all redirected southward into a uh, a war that most of us who knew the Saudis and the, and the Yemenis knew the Saudis could never win. And so by doing, you know, it was one of the, the great low investment, high yield gambits. Now, over time, this, the Houthis have become closer to and more dependent on the Iranians. And so in that case, in that, criteria, that metric alone, the Saudi intervention has been counterproductive. It has driven the Houthis closer and closer to the Iranians um, with very little investment by the Iranians. That said, the Houthis still are an independent player. This is a, a marriage of convenience. Um, the Iranians want to distract the Saudis, the Houthis want to get rid of the Saudis. And it works to both sides' advantage. Um, and it works to Iran's advantage on several scores. So, you know, don't take a knife to a gunfight. You think that the uh, Biden administration, assuming that it reengages and, and yeah. convince okay. the Iranians um, to reengage, will have a salutary effect in, in, in Yemen? I think, no, I, I, I think it will on, on two counts. One, um, Kerry almost got an agreement um, on the Yemen war in the last days of the Obama administration. And as soon as, as Trump was elected, um, the Hadi government, the internationally legitimate, although no place else legitimate government, um, and the Saudis understood that Trump's fixation on Iran work to their advantage. And so they ceased negotiating. They didn't have to. They were suddenly going to have, you know, a stronger ally. Um, and I th think it's worth noting that it was the Obama administration that backed the Saudis when they went in in March of 15. Um, and um, I think that there was a recognition that that was a mistake on our part. I do think the Biden administration for a number of reasons um, is, is going to be far more engaged in trying to find that negotiated settlement because that's the only way it's going to end. There is no military victory. One is um, particularly Democrats in the Senate. You know, the Senate has actually passed legislation to restrict U.S. military support for the Saudi operation in Yemen. Trump but there's a common, utterly, utterly grotesque humanitarian crisis. And um, Americans have been shielded from seeing the photographs of what famine looks like in a country to a child. There's been one major photograph on the front of one New York Times Sunday magazine at least, if not a year ago, possibly two years ago. So you've got the humanitarian side of it. You've got a geopolitical issue, which is I think that there's going to be a recalibration of our relationship with Saudi Arabia, at least with Mohammed bin Salman. Nobody expects us to walk away from the Saudis. But one way of signaling a recalibration 
would be to end military support for the Saudi effort in Yemen. And that also fits with a peace process. And that also fits with the humanitarian. And then at the same time, and I don't know quite how this is gonna to fit together, but it does, is the conventional wisdom in town is that one of the first things that uh, the new administration will do is to re-engage on the JCPOA. Now they can't do that without anything back from the Iranians. Um, certainly the Iranians backing out of some of the steps they've taken since our departure from the agreement. But I can see a situation where, you know, we will come back into the JCPOA, we're going to pull back on our support for Saudi military operations in Yemen, and we need you, Iran, to at least make one effort to pull back your regional meddling, and that would be you need to support a peace process. So I think that all of those will kind of can fit together in a way that would benefit Yemen. Well, thank you very much. I have at least a half dozen questions, but let me turn <laughs> things over to uh, uh, to Dr. Pearson and remind our uh, uh, listeners or viewers that they can send their questions through to him through chat. Carl. Well, let me first uh, thank you very much for uh, your talk this afternoon. Um, and if I could uh, ask a question to get things started. Um, could you explain sort of factually, um, first of all, factually, what, who the UAE and the Saudis are backing? Um, my understanding is that those are, are, are distinct now. And could you then explain the strategic imagination of the Saudis and UAE uh, for backing different factions? Oh, yes. That is such a nice, simple sounding question. Um, first of all, I, I, there is a new website called the Yemen Matrix um, that the Washington Institute has just recently done. And it's an interactive uh, website where you can really see all of these parties and how if you push one, it moves the other way. It is a circular firing squad. And Yemeni politics are nothing if not kaleidoscopic. As I said, the Houthi spent 10 years fighting the Saleh government. And then when they came in and took over Sana'a and ended up at the beginnings of the civil war with, with Hadi, the government, um, they joined forces with Saleh. And even somebody who has worked on Yemen for decades did not see that one coming. Uh, they had literally been shooting at each other and then turned around and were allies. Um, so you've got the, not only the, inter the internationally recognized government is President Hadi, who was Saleh's vice president, peaceful transfer of power under a GCC negotiated agreement. Hadi, is based in Riyadh as, as is most of his cabinet and fully supported by and utterly dependent upon the Saudis. They are not really a military force. He does not have any legitimacy or minimal legitimacy within Yemen itself. So Hadi is totally dependent on the Saudis. And the major agenda is to defeat the Houthi and restore this government of questionable legitimacy. The Houthi are in the north, primarily, well, almost exclusively. They are indigenous and um, an indigenous insurgency. Um, they get some support from Iran, but not nearly as much as people are concerned about. If the Iranians really, really, really wanted to support the Houthis, they would be giving them anti-aircraft guns to shoot down Saudi uh, planes, and they haven't. They've given the Houthis enough to keep them going, but there was so much weaponry floating around in Yemen beforehand. And when Saleh joined the Houthi in 1415, 
he brought about 60 or 70 percent of the military and their weaponry with them. And in the Houthi course of sort of rolling as far as Aden before they were pushed back, they also took over any number of military sites. So the Houthis get ammunition and stuff, but they basically are, a, you know, self self driven. Um, so that's Houthis and Iran, Hadi and the Saudis. The Emiratis, um, it took me a while to figure this one out, longer than it should have. I couldn't figure out why the, Yemen, why the Emiratis were involved in this. Saudis, Houthis, Iran, I got that. Why are the Emiratis involved in this? They don't, except for tracing their roots back to the collapse of the Marib Dam, really aren't a presence in Yemen. It's they're not even contiguous. Um, but the Emiratis are fixated on Islam, is violent Islamicism to the same way that the Saudis are fixated on Iran. Um, and much more importantly, the Emiratis are playing a big power game as a very small power. They're called the small Sparta uh, by both friends and not friends. Um, but there's only so far you can go when you have a population of 800,000. But their primary geostrategic interest is to protect sea lanes. In a sense, they're almost like a, a neo-British neo imperialist. They want those sea lanes. And it's one of the reasons that the Emiratis have been developing such a strong presence in the Horn of Africa um, is they want those sea lanes all the way from Dubai to the Med to be secure. And so the Emiratis first came in, they were the, actually the ground troops. The Saudis never put boots on the ground. And anytime they do, they get whooped. Um, the Emiratis were actually the ground troops and they're a very effective military. They also had a lot of mercenaries. They came in and took Aden back by July of 15. And they thought the war was over. And the Saudis then said, well, actually, no. Um, they have stayed close to the coast, McCullough, Aden, and not quite to Hodeida. Um, and they have been training their own forces um, and they've been very effective at that. And basically what their goal was, they could care less about a Houthi. The Houthis are Saudi's problems. So the Emiratis have actually created a separate government in the South called the Southern Transition Council, um, in, which is based in Aden, because what the Emiratis want is not control of, but influence over Makala, Port of Makala, Port of Aden, Port of Hodeida. And so um, several, almost a year, well, I guess about a year ago, um, my t one thing about COVID is I have no sense of time anymore. I don't know when things happened. Uh, the Emiratis unilaterally walked out of, of Yemen. They turned things over to the STC, their self-created government, and they have a lot of their own trained forces, Yemeni forces, but they left. And I think part of the, the reason they left is that A, they weren't, the Houthi fight wasn't their fight. Um, the Saudi reputation was badly tarnished by Khashoggi and was also very badly tarnished by the outcry over the effects of the Saudi bombardment of Yemen. And the Emiratis guard their reputation and above all. And so they saw themselves getting tagged with the Saudi bad PR for a fight they didn't care about. And they all, this was also at about the same time that there were the attack on the um, oil tankers in the Gulf. And interestingly, the Emiratis did never blame the Iranians for that, and in fact, sent a peace delegation to Tehran. So there was some seismic shift in Abu Dhabi at about that time where they said, this is not serving our interest. 
So the Southerners are backed by the Emiratis and they're totally dependent on the Emiratis. The Hadi's government is in Riyadh, totally dependent on the Saudis. And the Houthis are indigenous and get some support from Iran. And then you've got all sorts of minor players who sort of connect that. And when I teach this class, by the time I finish answering your question, I have a chalkboard that is full of names and places and arrows that are sort of connecting and not connecting all over the place. Untangling this is going, well, the Emiratis have helped the process of detangling by basically withdrawing their official presence and pushing a peace agreement. Um, as I said, there's a avenue for the Iranians to make nice um, by doing the same with the Houthi, which will cost them nothing. Um, most people believe that the major step is the Saudis need to fully engage on a ser on on pushing Hadi to peace. Um, they try doing this with the Riyadh agreement because just to complicate it a little bit more, I love Yemen. The Emirati STC based in Aden militarily with guns firing drove the remnants of the Hadi government out of Aden. Now the Emirates and the Saudis are supposed to be allied in support of Hadi yet the Emirati STC violently threw the Hadi government out. Um, so this is a complicated civil war. Um, the Saudis have tried to negotiate that with the Riyadh agreement and it's but an utter failure. The real linchpin on this is the Saudis and then letting the Yemenis talk it out. Thank you. That that was actually a very coherent uh, answer. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I will remind our audience if they would like to ask a question, that please type it into the chat box. Um, and that here is is one. Uh, actually, it's three. How harmful uh, is the cot drug to the economy of Yemen on a large scale? One. Two. Do you see the efforts towards creating economic growth with high quality coffee? A potential avenue for progress? And three, do you see the idea of achieving peace and security through a unified Yemen with international intervention ever possible again? Oi. Um, wow. Um, okay, got first. Um, for those who may not know, it is a leaf you chew from a, if you're really into it from about three o'clock in the afternoon till midnight. Uh, other people, it's more like just a long happy hour. Um, it's a raw leaf. It, it's the equivalent of going to the ficus tree in your grandmother's house and stripping the leaves and chewing on them. Um, I never chewed it because I couldn't really quite figure out why that was something I wanted to do. Um, it's a mild stimulant. It's a first cousin to coffee oddly enough. Um, it's, it doesn't cause violence like alcohol. It isn't as detrimental to your health as smoking. Um, and so in terms of kind of social habits, it's actually not a bad one. The problem with it is that it does take up a lot of the very scarce water, and it takes up time. Two caveats on that. The water wastage, which is significant, is due primarily to the irrigation method. The Yemenis use water the way Egyptians do who live near the, the Nile. They do flood irrigation. And that's fine if you live near the Nile. It doesn't work if you're doing, if you're tapping aquifers. So, even if you replace the gut with the coffee or other, or even a plant that you could eat for nutrition, I'd rather it's something they could actually eat. Um, if you don't change the irrigation method, you're not gonna save water. So the real problem on that side with the gut is the irrigation, not the plant. Um, 
economically, God is, is useful because a farmer can go into their, it's kind of like an orchard, and you just strip off the top three feet of the got plant and you bundle it all up and then you put it in the back of your Hilux truck and you drive it to the nearest town and you open the truck and people come and buy their bundles and off you go because all got shoes are BYOQ. Um, the farmer harvests the crop in the morning. You have to chew it within 24 hours. Harvest it in the morning, drives it into town, sells it by, whoops, sells it by three o'clock gets the cash in hand and goes home. There is an immediate circulation of money from the farmer and the city and back to the farmer. That is important economically. More importantly, God is, it is the core of Yemeni society. Uh, and Lisa Wadeen uh, wrote a great book on Yemen called Peripheral Vision. And she does a chapter on God, which is the only one I've ever read that was any good. It is how Yemenis, how Yemen functions. Um, everybody gathers in the afternoon, you know, great big a mufraj, um, and they all sit there and munch on these leaves, and they talk about everything. They talk about contracts. They talk about families. They talk about marriages. They talk politics. The Yemenis are the most political people I've ever met. They can talk politics more than anybody here living in Washington. And they talk about it openly and they talk about it candidly. Everybody in Yemen is somehow related to each other. It's 30 million people and they're all second cousins to somebody. It's, it's remarkable. Um, at these got shoes, first of all, everyone is equal. And I've been to enough. I don't chew God, but I went to got shoes. Um, if there isn't somebody in the government at, in the Mufraj, their first cousin is, or their brother is, or their father is. And government people also will go to these and hear what's going on. So it's where you get, it's the participatory part of Yemeni life. It is not a substitute for, for actual government and functioning democratic governance. But it is participatory, it is candid, it is political. There is a, a, an instant contact between the governing and the governed, who are generally related to each other anyway. Um, and if you were to try to outlaw God, it would be the equivalent of shutting down every Starbucks and every sports bar in this country. And we kind of tried that with the early days of COVID and it didn't work very well. Um, it would bring the country to a halt. It's, it's the glue. So the question is not to get rid of God, but to farm it smart, reduce the time and keep it as a function. Um, one of the reasons it also doesn't cause the lack of economic development it's a reflection of it. If you don't have a job or your job is minimal, you get up in the morning, you do it in the morning, you have your great big long family lunch and then you've got nothing to do. So you chew gut. So what I saw was to the extent that people had a job, their gut consumption went down. To the extent they don't have a job, their gut consumption goes up. So. God is a reflection, not a cause. Coffee, um, that's everyone always thinks, well, gee, they can just grow coffee. They invented it. Egyptians, uh, Ethiopians also challenged that, but we'll let that go. Two problems, a couple of problems. I mean, yes, they should. And it is another crop they could use. First of all, if you take out a got plant and you put in a coffee plant, it takes nine years for that coffee plant to be productive. What is that farmer gonna do, who's already living on a dollar a day, gonna do for nine years to feed his family while he's waiting for that freaking coffee plant to start doing something? Coffee is also dependent on an on international market, which is always makes you vulnerable to swings in the market. They should 
put in some more coffee. They grow superb coffee. It is, it is magnificent. They can grow a lot of other things. They grow some of the most fantastic grapes, apricots, almonds. Um, it was called Arabia Felix by the Romans. And that actually translates as fertile, not necessarily happy. It is a fertile country. If they use the water correctly, they could grow crops they could actually eat as well as crops they could export. So coffee is one avenue, but I wouldn't, I don't see it as the panacea. Will Yemen ever be unified? Um, yeah, to the extent that it ever was. I mean, we described Yemen when I was there as primordial federalism that you have, there are some functions of central government you need to have to function. But basically the regions took care of themselves. Uh, I was in Yemen during Y2K, if we all remember that. And as we all remember, the entire world was gonna come to a roaring screeching halt the minute that every computer in the world clicked over to 2000. And we were asked by the government, ours, to you know do a, an assessment of what the impact of Y2K would be on Yemen. And I got in a bunch of trouble because I sent back a very short response which said, Yemen is still working on Y1K. Um, humor is not always appreciated, but it was true. Um, this was not a computer connected economy, society, government or anything else. Things have changed in 20 years, but it always operated in a very decentralized manner. And so Yemen's challenge, and this is with the National Dialogue Conference, they got like 95% of getting everything. They had like 1800 recommendations for the uh, Constitutional Committee. The one place they couldn't quite close the gap was how do you set up a federal system? And how federal is it? Is it the 22 governance? Is it six supra regions, which never made any sense to me. Um, but nobody has ever in their right mind suggested that Yemen can be run by a central government. It can't. It isn't the nature of Yemenis. It isn't the nature of the topography. It isn't it isn't their nature. So there will be a unified state, but it's going to be on some federalized system. And we all know how difficult federal systems are, particularly when it's resource allocation. Do the few places that produce some oil and gas, do they get more resources? Well, those parts of the country where the pipelines go, go well, if you didn't have your pipeline coming through my government, your oil would be worth anything. And then the people who live at the other end where the terminals are say, well, if we didn't have a port and we didn't manage it, it wouldn't be worth anything. How you do resource allocation and how much autonomy you give to regions and how much is kept by the central, that is going to be the toughest issue. I personally think Yemen will hold together, but it's going to be hard and it's going to take a lot of compromise with particularly the Adenis who see themselves as a co-equal partner to Sana'a. Actually, if I can jump back, jump back in, uh, yeah. that was a question I sort of had as well um, about the unity of the country because it looked like the, it looked as if the Emiratis were at the very least comfortable with the notion of repartitioning, if not actively sort of seeking to repartition yeah. uh, Yemen. I mean, is that sort of your impression as well? And have they sort of given up on that and are willing to, uh, uh, willing to sort of let, let the Yemenis work that out? Yeah. Um, yeah, when the Emiratis, I think, the Emiratis want, as I said, a lot of influence over Aden, but not necessarily responsible for running it. And so they did help create this Southern Transition Council, which is basically Adeny based. 
whether they would go so far as to agree to a repartition, I'm not sure. I mean, I think they've kind of left it to the STC and the STC has very limited reach. I mean, first of all, it's seen as an Emirati creation, which never helps your legitimacy. And second, um, sometime last spring, God, my time sense is so bad now. Um, the STC in a fit of peak declared basically unilateral independence. You know, we're out of here, uh, which was everyone's nightmare. One of the problems in Yemen, and I've, I've had this conversation with so many Yemenis over decades, is tell me who, where is the South? What is the South? The 1990 line, which was actually negotiated by the Brits and the Turks, was illogical. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't follow topography. It didn't follow Sunni Shia, or I'm sorry, Zaidi Shafi divisions. It, it followed nothing. It was truly artificial. And so I kind of like, okay, so we're gonna have Southern autonomy. Who the hell's the South? Where are you drawing that line? Uh, the Shafi, the, the, the South is large, is almost all Shafi. But most Shafi actually live in North Yemen in something that's called Lower Yemen. And Lower Yemen is the Southern part of Northern Yemen, but it's North of South Yemen, if I have completely lost you on that. Um, so who, who are you talking about? You're really just talking about a bunch of grumpy Aidenies. Well, so when the STC declared independence, the Hadra Mount, which is most of that huge thing to the east, and Mahra, and Shebwa, and Socotra, in other words, a lot of the rest of what was the old PDRY said, uh, no, um, no, we're not following you on that. Um, we're not sure what status we want in whatever Yemen comes out of this mess, but we have no more intention of being under Aden's control than we really want to be under Sana'a's control. And you have to add to that, that, you know, as I said, Aden was a British crown colony. The Eastern governance were uh, province protectorates were sultanates of a medieval variety. When the PDRY, which was the only Marxist state in the Middle East, was created, the Aedini Marxist went after the Eastern Sultanates with all of the viciousness that you can well imagine a bunch of Marxists going after a bunch of 19th century Sultanates. So the folks to the East don't have warm memories of Aedini control. So when the STC tried to separate with or, and oh, and by the way, the Emiratis also said, uh, no, not a good idea. So the Emiratis did not support the STC unilateral independence and most of the South didn't support the STC independence. Um, and so I think almost by default, Yemen will stay together because nobody can figure out where do you draw the lines? Um, I mean, you and I know, you know will rock far better than I do, but even like drawing the line as to, okay, where is Kurdistan, you sort of know, but the line isn't clear. And when we went in in 03, you know, there was the Sunni part, the Shia part and the Kurdish part, except that there were 27 different religions and ethnic groups in, in Iraq, and there was no neat way to draw that line. And even though the Yemenis are all Arab and all Muslim, the line between what's Northern and what's Southern, what's even Eastern and Western is so fuzzy. And a lot of people, you know, you can have mixed marriages in any way you wanna describe that. And even back in the day when there were two Yemen, half of the Southern Yemeni cabinet was from the North and half of the Northern Yemeni cabinet was from the South. So it doesn't divide. <laughs> you have oh. to love country. 
Uh, that is fascinating, and I think we could go on another uh, hour, but uh, unfortunately, we probably ought to bring this to a close. Again, let me ask everyone to do whatever it is we do these days to uh, over Zoom to thank our wonderful speaker, thank Ambassador you. Barbara Bodine. Thank you very much, and we look forward to a chance of hosting you again in person. At well, some thank, point. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you all, you very thank you all much. for your time and attention and the great questions.